Well, hey, everybody, and good morning, and welcome to Providence Church. What a joy it is to be together today. And around here, we believe that there is joy in sharing news and joy in sharing pieces of our life with one another. So we've been doing these questions at the beginning. So Angela, here's my question for you today. What is a childhood Christmas memory that brings joy to your heart? There's there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, so we would go to my aunt and uncle's house mm-hmm. and um, there was just excitement about just even driving to their house. My uncle always gave us these like half dollars like or dollar coins, yes. you know, they were like yep. bigger and it was like 50 cents or a dollar. But like there was just such a great anticipation yeah. to yeah. get there and like get it like fit in the, you know, the whole, yes. pot, just filled up the whole palm of your hand. So that brings me joy. Love thinking that. about that family Love time that. together. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me hear yours. Yeah, real quick. Mine is, uh, I grew up, until I was in my 20s, I had a great grandma. And so we would go to my great grandmother's house in Pavo, Georgia, like this like dot on a map. And it would be like 100 people because like how big the family had gotten at that level. And all of my second, third, fourth cousins, like I would meet people I didn't know there and you're like related. But we played football in the backyard, we played on the farm, and then we drank cane syrup, like real cane syrup, and we'd always get sick. What was that? I don't know that I've ever Yeah, we'll have to talk about it off. We'll talk about it off camera. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, well, if you're here, we wanna know, we wanna know what something brings you joy. So put that in the comments now Mm -hmm. and in the in the chat it's already going. But if you're new around here, especially if you're a guest with us for the first time. We're so glad you're here. And if you've got some time after the service, we'd love to meet you in a video Zoom call and hear more about it and more about you and your life. So it doesn't have to be for a long period. Just keep an eye out for that link after the service is over. You're also invited to jump into the chat, share your news with us in that space. And that goes for all of you worshiping with us today, not just our guests. And if there's anything we can join you in prayer about, just click the request prayer button on your screen and one of our pastors will join you in a private chat to pray. If you came prepared to give today, you're invited to do that now in any of the ways you see on the screen or by clicking the Give button along the top of the page. Well, today we are celebrating the third Sunday in Advent, which is the season when we prepare our hearts for the arrival of Jesus, our long-awaited Savior. And this Sunday, in addition to the hope and peace candles that we've lit over the last two weeks, we light the joy candle and are reminded that God has given us a joy that no one can take away ever. No matter what happens in this world, we can have light and can experience joy because of Jesus. Well, our scripture each week throughout the Advent season is Isaiah 9-2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Light has shined on them. Light has shined on you. And we thank God for that light. And we look for it in every place and every way. So welcome to church.
need you, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, the King is coming. Open up your eyes to see it. Open up your ears to hear it. Oh, the King is coming. Open up your minds, believe it. Open up your heart and receive him. The King is coming. Open up your eyes. Maybe you're seated. I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, that is our heart before you as we gather together as your church in this room and online, wherever we find ourselves in this moment. Our, our heart before you, God, is that we need a king. And so we have this anticipation for what you might yet do in our lives. And it's not detached from what you've already done. And so, God, we tell the stories, we tell them over and over again of who you are and how you've come to us in Jesus. God, would you come to us again? Your people are waiting and yearning and longing. And, God, our hearts have so much more capacity for the love that you pour into us. So, God, as we gather together as your church and as your people, would you would you do a work in us that doesn't just prepare us for a one-day celebration, but for a newness of life that comes when Jesus comes into our midst and into, into our hearts and brings transformation. God, bring transformation through your word today. God, our, our hearts are with all of the, the pains and the hurts just around the world. We don't, we don't need another example of the brokenness of the world, but God, you have come to bring redemption. You are our rescuer. And so we look to your son, Jesus Christ, and we join our hearts and we join our voices together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, the light of the world, the one that he taught us to pray together when we come and pray. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before Pastor Jacob comes and shares our message with us today, I want to remind you of a couple of things that are really important for us as we're heading through this Advent season. Christmas Eve is now, I think, just a couple of weeks away. Uh, the 23rd and the 24th, we have uh, several opportunities for you to come and to worship. We'll have a beautiful time of candlelight and communion. We'll come together. We've been lighting these candles. We'll light the Christ candle on that night together, and we will celebrate the coming of Jesus. We'd love for you to come and be a part of that with us. We're actually asking that you'll go ahead and save a spot 
uh, at one of those services. And so um, some of those are, are, we've got people that are signing up already, so thank you for doing that. On the 23rd, we've added a service already. So we've added a service at 4 o'clock, and then we have one at 5.30, and then four of them, 1, 2, 30, 4, and 5.30 on the 24th. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. One of the most exciting things that we get to do at our Christmas Eve service every single year is we collect an offering, and every year to date, it's been the biggest offering of the year, and every year to date, we have given that offering away, 100% of it away, to a couple of amazing ministries. Uh, this year, the ministries that, that the Christmas Eve offering are, is going towards is El Porvenir, our, our, our pot partners um, in Nicaragua who are putting water wells um, in a whole community. And in that community, we have already seen transformation over the last several years that we have partnered with them. And so they have set some really big goals that we might be able to reach almost 100% of the people in that area that they would have water in their homes and have a, have a chance at life. And so we're able to give to that this year. The other one is the Mount Juliet Help Center right here in Mount Juliet. It's an amazing ministry. We've been partnering with them. Every month, you guys bring um, tons and tons of food that go out through the Mount Juliet Help Center to people who are in need in our community because we're seeing everyone fed. And so they are actually expanding their operations, and we get to help them build a new building to reach more and more people this year. So that is what our Christmas Eve offering is going towards. You can tell we get excited about that. So we hope that you'll be praying about how you can be a part of the Christmas Eve offering. One more thing I want to tell you about is this coming Tuesday night is our Lights of Hope service. Now, we just lit the candle of joy, we said tonight. And, and so for so much of us and so much of the time during the Christmas season, we can focus in on the joy. But there are those of us we recognize that are experiencing grief and are experiencing hurt in the middle of that. So like we can have both of those things. We can have joy and grief at the same time. And so that service on that Tuesday night is to come and recognize that and to look together for the light of Christ, for the light of hope to come and just lead us through the rest of this season. We would love to invite you to come and be a part of that service next Tuesday night. Thank you, guys. All right. Good evening. It's great to see you and welcome you to Providence. I'm Jacob, one of the pastors here. Thanks, Mark, for... Uh, leading us into this time. Uh, I want to invite you, if you're able, uh, to please stand for the reading of the gospel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This uh, story I just read to you, it's often uh, uh, referred to in some way about Joseph and his dream. Joseph and his dream. But I want you to notice tonight, um, first notice uh, that before Joseph had a dream, he had a plan, okay? And before Joseph had a plan, he had a problem. So look at that with me. Problem, plan, dream. Problem, plan, dream. What was his problem? His fiance was pregnant. And I'll add three words to that. Not by him. His fiance was pregnant, not by him. And that was a very big problem for him and for Mary and for them together. Uh, today, you might think if you had a problem with your 
fiance, you just kind of scoot, right? Move on. But in that day, the engagement, the betrothal, was as legally binding as a marriage. And so for Joseph to get out of that, it was not going to be easy. But don't just think about it that way. I want you to understand that Joseph was also a really, really good guy. Okay? So it wasn't just like he's wrestling with the legal part. He, was also, he, his, he had a really good heart. And not only that, Joseph really loved Mary. You know, so it's not e- as easy as, as we might draw it up. So it's a really intense circumstance because Joseph wanted to do what was right by her and for her. So what did Joseph do with his problem? Any guesses? He made a plan. He had a big problem. And so he made a plan. And that's what most of us do when we face a problem is we start working it out. We make a plan. And here's Joseph's plan. I think this is uh, remarkable that we know Joseph's plan all these years later, that Matthew decided to let us know this is what Joseph was planning to do. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind, that's a plan, to divorce her, but to divorce her um, quietly. So the plan that Joseph made was not to stay with Mary. He made a plan to not, to not stick it out with Mary, but, but he wanted to do that in a way that would not publicly shame her or lead her into punishment. So Joseph uh, made what we might consider, uh, you know, a good plan under the circumstances, <laughs> a reasonable plan for a good guy who had got some really unexpected news and he's trying to sort it out in his brain. You know, life stuff, Life throws stuff at you, and we have to figure out uh, plans. And Joseph's plan in this moment was divorce, but in the best way he could manage it, you know, with the least amount of pain possible. Problem, plan, and then a dream. I really like seeing this progression because I usually think about dreams happening in the best of circumstances, Right? That's how I usually, like, I think a dream's going to, like, when I think about a dream, it's like, yeah, the dr- everything's set up just right for the dream. Uh, you know, so, like, if I think about the dream for my life, I'm usually thinking about everything going really well and getting to live into the dream. Or I have some dreams for my kids, and that usually involves me uh, putting together a lot of plans for everything to be just right <laughs> for the dream to happen. Or some of y'all have dreams for your grandchildren, and so what are you doing? You're, like, putting stuff in place so that everything can be in a good place. Why? So they can live into the dream. But most of the time, really good dreams don't come in the best of circumstances. They come like this, problem, plan, <laughs> dream. And so I like, I like kind of seeing it there to think about what Joseph was going through and then what we experience in this world. Because my experience is that everybody has problems. Amen? <laughs> Everybody I've ever known has got some problems. And everybody also has a dream from God. They're together. Everybody I've ever met has problems, some big ones and a bunch of little ones. And as we read God's word, as we we, uh, let the Bible be a way that God speaks to us about, uh, about his people that are now us as his people, we see that God's chosen people, he's trying to show us. Everybody I see in the Bible has got some problems and this dream. Now, I read to you tonight from Matthew chapter one, and uh, I began with verse 18. If you were to go and look in your Bible right now and say, well, what is verses one through 17 of Matthew chapter one? How does Matthew start his story about Jesus? What you find is a genealogy, uh, a long list of who came before leading up to Joseph. So it's Joseph's ancestors. And obviously the reason we're getting that is because Jesus finds himself in that lineage. So I wouldn't read it to you tonight because it'd be a bunch of names and names I have trouble pronouncing, but it's just kind of name after name after name. And in that list are liars, cheaters, um, uh, more than one widow and widower. Uh, There are foreigners in the list. There are multiple murderers. There are multiple... Uh, people who cheated on their spouse, adulterers. Uh, There is more than one prostitute by name. 
Like these aren't even just like, these are the kind of people. It's like uh, by name. And so the names are listed. They're all in there. And it's not so we'll just kind of drop our heads and be ashamed of, of the people, right? It's not like when you go to the family gathering and you're like, your weird uncle's there and you're like, I don't really want to look at him. Some of you are like, I don't have a weird uncle. That probably means you're the weird uncle, <laughs> you know, by the way. So, but, so we all have in our family these folks, right? And what we're being shown here is not a list of folks. If you know the names, if you read the names, you're like, oh gosh, they included, they included the story of Judah and Tamar, really? Rahab's in there? Oh, okay. Uh, all the stuff David did, David's like lifted up. Um, it, it's not so we'll drop our heads and be, be ashamed. It's actually to show us that uh, the family that Jesus came from shows us about the family that Jesus is coming for. And so when you see Jesus' family and you're like, oh man, that's a cast of characters. That's some problems. That's problem after problem after problem. Then when you go to your family Christmas, you're like, oh, I get it. What do we get? If God had a dream for them, he has a dream for us. (laughs) And so we have Mary and Joseph, <laughs> this big old problem, and this big old dream. God dreams will make your stomach hurt. That's my experience. I have a, a one mentor pastor who would talk about making hard decisions for the church, and he would say, I've learned over the years, Jacob, that well, it's usually like when I'm feeling nauseous, that's kind of letting me know where I'm supposed to go. He called it discernment by nausea. You know, it's like, oh, that doesn't feel, you know, like it's stirring. Not that it feels like a bad thing. It's just like stirring up in you. It kind of makes your stomach hurt. We'll take a step, right? Take a step and see what happens. Um, Joseph was facing a really tough thing. And he did what most of us would do. He put together a, a really reasonable plan, a plan that would work. But the dream, I think, would have made his stomach turn, <laughs> And that may be your biggest hurdle to overcome in going after God's dream for your life. It may not be all these obstacles that you might think about. It actually might be that you're so convinced your plan will work. And you're actually probably right. There's a lot of you know, smart, astute people in here. You could put together good and reasonable plans. Joseph's plan would have worked. But he, when he woke up that morning, instead he had something that I think probably made his stomach turn, made his stomach hurt a little bit. Oh, and every time, uh, there's some things I say here that I, uh, I'll, I'll lift one up to you. Like some of y'all have heard us talking about, Mark just lifted up our dream for the Mount Juliet Help Center, which is to uh, see the building expand uh, so that hungry people can be fed. And oftentimes when I'm talking about doing feeding stuff here, I will say something like, and just if you didn't know, we have a crazy dream here at Providence Church to see everyone fed in Wilson County. And when I say it, there's this kind of this excitement that builds up in me. I'm like, yeah, I believe it. And then I also like am looking for Tums, you know. <laughs> we began three years talking about a, a countywide dream that now dozens of churches have taken on, which is um, to see everyone fed in Wilson County, everyone free from addiction, everyone safe from abuse and domestic violence and uh, trafficking, and everyone ready, which is about every student in Wilson County by the time they reach the age of 18, that they do graduate and they're able to live into God's dream. And it's so fun to say, I love saying it. I wasn't even planning on saying it right there. I just wanted to say it out there. There's like this excitement. And it's also like, what are you saying? You know, everyone fed. And then I think there's no good reason in Wilson County for any kid to go to bed hungry, right? And so we'll push, um, push a little bit into the dream. What, uh, the best way I know how to describe this kind of feeling that I'm talking about, if you find yourself experiencing it or even experiencing it now, is that God dreams create a sense of urgency in us and they feel eternal at the same time. What that means is they get you going. There is a sense of urgency when you hear God speaking to you like, what can I do right now? I got to do something. But they also have this sense of, of an eternal sense, which I will say can feel unattainable right? So it's like this, like, we got to do something, right? We do that all the time here at Providence. We got to do something. And then we're like, everyone fed? And so we just keep saying it. We keep stepping into it. God is not going to give you a three-year plan to live into his dream. 
he, he is playing a much longer game than that. <laughs> God has his, I mean, we're singing the king is coming, right? This is a much, a much longer game. It's a bigger, grander, eternal vision. So uh, to unpack a little bit more about this feeding thing, in 2008, our church started, and we were a church that was meeting in, in Stoner Creek Elementary, and we uh, one of the first Sundays, a kid, this was planned, so you're like, oh, wow, that was like angelic. It was planned. A kid rolled a red wagon down the center aisle, and we put canned foods in it because we learned that senior adults in our county were hungry and that kids in our schools were hungry and, pa- and teachers were having to figure out um, ways to feed kids before they could teach them math and all these kind of things. And we're like, we want to be a part of that. I mean, we were just a small group of people in an in a, in a elementary school gym, but it felt urgent to do something. Well, that has grown into, if you come to church here now, every month, you know, we're bringing, uh, as Regina and Mark have told us, like thousands of pounds of food. So the little red wagon is like a big box truck we're taking every month. It's crazy. And then this year, we want to see the expansion of a building. So as you start urgently living into God's vision, the containers get bigger and bigger and bigger, but the goal is still the same. It's still a big, grand vision for God's people to be taken care of. And we have a great, good, merciful God who wants good things. So we need both of those. We need the urgent and the eternal if we're going to live in God's dream. And so um, think about in your life, a lot of what we do is just sort of the urgent, (laughs) Just kind of like getting it done. I mean, most of my days are like getting it done, getting it done, getting it done. I've heard, I've heard it called like the tyranny of the urgent. So it's like the urgent things get all of our attention and we pour all that into it. And then we can find ourselves like a month later or a year later or a decade later and think, what about my dream? Because we've just been doing the urgent things over and over and over. And so, um, but if all you have is, so that's the urgent, but if all you have is the big dream, you're going to be really overwhelmed, right? You're going to be really, really overwhelmed. So in 2008, we knew that uh, uh, if we had known in 2008, I got to have a, we need a six-figure gift to give to the Mount Juliet Help Center to partner with them for this big vision. We would have just had to tap out, right? But what we had instead was what the urgent moment we were in required, and we needed to keep our eyes on a grander vision that could get us to a place where the container gets bigger and bigger. That's what Joseph does. So Joseph starts, he has to start doing the urgent thing. I have to protect Mary. I have to keep her from condemnation. I have to get her from Nazareth to Bethlehem in the busiest travel time of the year on my, on my donkey. I need a place to stay, a cradle for the baby. You see all these urgent things? But in the midst of all that, Joseph had in his mind, he will save the people from their sins. Isn't that cool? So even though he was doing the temporal kind of things right in that moment, he also knew that baby was going to save the world. And so what I'm trying to show is like, we get invited into that right now. We get to do these things and we should do urgent things, but we also need to remember the bigger thing, the bigger dream that we get to be a part of. And the best word that I could come to that sums up sort of how Joseph holds both those together. So if you're thinking, how can I hold together all these things I have to get done and maybe even begin to think that God has a dream for my life. The word that Joseph teaches us is obedience. Obedience. And God dreams will require obedience, obedience to God and obedience to God's word. You'll have to try to hear what he's saying and then be obedient to what he is asking. So Joseph wakes up with a stomach ache and he has to choose my plan or God's dream. His stomach's turning, right? He'd made the plan. It was a, it was a good plan. It would work. And then God's dream was before him. And one of the most powerful scriptures, I think, in the whole Bible is Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. And it says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He chose God's dream. And I try to picture that. He went and knocked on Mary's door. And her dad answers the door, right? And he has the conversation with dad. And then he goes and helps Mary gather her stuff up in a bag. And he walks with her from her house in Nazareth to his house in Nazareth. They're walking down the street with his fiance, who's pregnant, not by him. And he takes her home as his wife because God told him to do that. That's obedience. 
And so in our lives, I have to choose and you have to choose my plan (laughs) or God's dream. And now I'm about to give you some really good news, okay? I'm about to give you some really good news. When you see that, when I do it like that, that's a great visual, isn't it? Like I just came up with that in this moment. Uh, when When you see that, Um, you would think that those two things are diametrically opposed to each other. My plan and God's dream. And I will tell you, the choosing of them is like that. You have to choose one or the other. But what we find, what we see uh, with with Joseph is that um, God's dream for his life was actually the best of all his plans. So get this, Joseph clearly had a dream to marry Mary and have some kids, and have this wonderful life. And now he finds himself in a place where if he chooses his plan, he gives all that up. And God's working something in the midst of the problem that's a dream that will take a long time to live into and even longer to see. But if he will choose God's plan, he will get to live into all those things. He will actually get to be a part of things that he never even dreamed. So we're hoping, God, would you kind of let me do the thing that has all the things I ever dreamed of? And God says, I'm going to let you be a part of things of all the things you never even dreamed of, that you never even thought of, Joseph, that you were going to get to be a part of the story, just like Matthew chapter 1, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah, and Tamar, and Rahab. You said Rahab? Yes. And David, and all these names of people we don't even know. And then Joseph and Mary and Jesus. You choose God's dream and you get to live into all these things you never even dreamed of. My daughter Mary tore her ACL a a few weeks ago. She's a senior in high school. And so that tiny ligament uh, meant that she will not compete in the national competition uh, for cheerleaders in Orlando that she had earned and she worked for her whole high school career. And it meant she would not get to dance in her senior dance recital, which is tonight. And a bunch of other, she will not. And that is not the plan that her mother and I made for her senior year. So on Monday, she had her surgery. And Rachel and I took off work, and we took her down there. And only one parent could go in because of COVID. So uh, Mary likes her mom better. And so Rachel got to, <laughs> to, got to go in. And I went and sat in a coffee shop, and Rachel and I texted throughout. Because we'd never done something like that where she was under anesthesia. And she's like our jewel, right? She's our prize. She's our treasure. And Rachel and I were doing really good. You know, we were really good. We were really strong. And they're giving us the updates during the surgery. And then she gets out of the surgery, and she goes to recovery. And that was kind of when we started to frazzle a little bit because we thought we should be able to see her her sooner than they were saying. And we were just kind of getting anxious. And Rachel's texting me and I'm like, go get a mama bear, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And finally, uh, finally, they let her go back to see Mary to, to like bring her bag. And so Rachel's going back into recovery. Well, I guess Rachel took a wrong turn and she walked into the sterile area of the operating room. And she's like standing back there and this physician sees her and she doesn't have scrubs on and she doesn't have her hair covered. And Rachel got some hair, you know, and it's like, it doesn't need to be, be in there. And so a nurse begins to escort her out. And then it turns out that physician goes to our church. He's like, Rachel is like, what are you doing in the operating room? And it's like, they help her get to where Mary was. And from there, we just got frazzled and frazzled and frazzled. Like we, they, we felt like we had to leave too quick. And we got this kid who just had surgery in our, our van and it was rush hour traffic in Nashville. And, and I'm getting frustrated. And Rachel's like, don't slam the brakes. I'm like, I didn't slam the brakes, you know? And we're just like, there's just a lot going on. And we get back to the house and we're trying to figure out how to get Mary upstairs with crutches. And we'd never done any of that. And our friends were there. They brought us dinner and they kind of let us just be frazzled. And then I had to go to the pharmacy to get these medications. And I got to the pharmacy and the pharmacist was so tender with me. And and she talked to me and answered my questions. And it was almost closing time, but she answered all those. And I I started to calm down. She's like, you can call me if you have any questions. Then I went back out to the car and that physician, the guy who goes to church here, Josh, he calls me. And he's like, what are you worried about, man? And I was like, I just don't know exactly, you know, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, and he, he, was, he was so calm and his expertise just helped me calm down. And I got into the drive through at Chick-fil-A because Rachel wanted a peppermint milkshake. And, and so I'm waiting in there and I text her and I told her I was getting that floor. And as I was beginning to see all those pieces come together, I just texted her and I said, you know what? We are so blessed. 
And do you know what she texted me back after that afternoon? She said, we are so blessed. And our plans were all messed up. But the dream was still intact. Our plans were so jacked up. But the dream, it wasn't even touched. You see what I'm saying? The dream that God has for our lives to be blessed, for abundance, for beauty, for us to be cared for, for people to look after us, for people to help us, for us to help others, like all the stuff, all the good stuff, the dream was still intact. And that's the cool thing, guys, with problem, plan, dream. Your plans can get all messed up, but God's dream for you will not be touched. With problem, plan, dream, if you choose God's dream instead of my plan, in the immediate, God is gonna take care of you. And I believe somebody just needs to hear that tonight. In the urgent, in the immediate, in all the things, God's gonna take care of you. He's gonna take care of it all. I believe that, that in the immediate, God is actually gonna take care of all the stuff you're worried about. But it's better than that. In the eternal, God's gonna save it all. So when you're in the midst of this stuff in real life, you're gonna see some stuff where like, whoo, I can see God's gonna take care of that. But there's some really big messes that, that are not gonna be touched in this life. And so what you can know is that God does not just have an urgent plan for your life. He has an eternal plan for your life. And in the eternal plan, he's gonna redeem it all. He's gonna save it. He's gonna save it. He's gonna bring Jesus back. So in the midst of Advent every year, this is crazy, right? We light these candles and we're like, we got this one candle we're gonna light in the middle. And it's like, oh, Christmas is coming. But we're not just saying that Christmas is coming. We're saying Jesus is coming back. That Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back into this world, into our life, into your family. So this is how the birth of Jesus came about. There was a problem, our sin, our brokenness, our genealogy, and we made all these plans, and then God gave a dream to Joseph. And this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. That's what the scripture says. This is how it happened. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And when Joseph woke up from the dream, he chose God's dream over his plan. When Joseph woke up, he chose God's dream over his plan. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. I'm so thrilled to invite Tinley up to the stage now for her baptism. She's a part of the family, guys, a part of this uh, story that we've been telling. <laughs> Come on up here, Tinley. Thanks for listening to the whole sermon. Good job. <laughs> you look out and turn and see these people. Now, Tinley has been so excited for this moment, for this night. And she and I, uh, one, I think it was a Thursday night, we sat kind of in the back and she, she told me about this desire that she had to give her life to Jesus and to be baptized. And then uh, her dad brought her back one day and we sat and talked for a while and we came in here and we prayed. And uh, she is a believer in Christ. Um, she has confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And tonight in your baptism, uh, we will celebrate that with you, Tinley, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you in this moment in a way, seal that decision in your heart. So I wanna ask you those two questions we talked about, okay? Do you repent of your sin? Yes. And do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior in union with the church, which he has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Yes. <laughs> Hold your, hold your nose, okay? <laughs> Tinley Rose Bowers, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> now, Tinley, if you'll turn this way, and family, if you'll put your hands on her shoulders, and uh, if you'll extend your hand as a way of blessing her. And I'm gonna ask Mark, I know you don't have a mic, it's okay, Mark, just pray over... Uh, uh, Tinley. Right, let's pray. Oh God, would you send your Holy Spirit over Tinley 
into her heart, into her mind, into her body, into her steps today and every day for the rest of her life so that she might remember this moment, not just as a moment um, that was where attention was on her, but a moment where your Holy Spirit was, was upon her um, in a new and powerful way that she could live out of. So God, may your spirit come like a dove upon her and may she hear you right now and for the rest of yes. her life, hear your voice saying to her, Tinley, you are my daughter. Yes. I'm well pleased in you. Yeah. You are mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm proud of you. Good job. Let's stand together and sing. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy Thank you for staying with us today as we continue in this Advent season. One of the things I love about what we're doing, Angela, is that we, you know, we, we start every series or every, not every series, every Sunday with the same scripture in Isaiah 9-2. Yeah. And we've been sitting in the last song is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus each Sunday. And I love that rhythm. Obviously, it doesn't work for every time, but for this season, it works really well. What's on your heart today after hearing Pastor Jacob preach? I thought about the um, proverb, I have it here, 2918. This is the message version. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. Wow. So it's like some versions say like, uh, where there is no vision, people perish. And it's like not our vision, but like God's vision, right? right? If people can't right. see what God is doing, um, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what God reveals, to mm. the vision of God, to the dreams that God gives us, um, they are most blessed. Love that. And it's like, wow. for me, I, it just seems so true, especially in what Jacob, you know, shared. It's like attending to those dreams and the visions of God. It's like right. he expressed how blessed, you know, he feels and yeah. his family feels and how blessed the church has been and mm -hmm. in the giving, you know. Yeah. Um, but I also thought about, you know, how we can compare like our blessings to other yes. people's blessings and yes. so not appreciate how God is blessing us specifically because yeah, wow. not everybody is going to receive those blessings in the same way right and so joy is founding in not comparing against what other people are receiving right. but just to be thankful and find joy in what God has given to us Love so that. it's been I really enjoyed this message. Yeah. So what's sitting on your heart? It was a good one. It was a really good one, wasn't it? Um, yeah, he had this line that stuck out. He said, uh, sometimes the dreams uh, make our stomach hurt. 
It's so good. And I think that's so true. And sometimes that stomach hurt is like fear, you know, and sometimes yes. that stomach hurt is like joy and excitement. You know, it's just like, it yes. could be all over the place. Rich Velotis, who is a pastor both of us like and read and stuff like that, he has this line, he says, the, the body is a major prophet, not a minor prophet. Mm -hmm. Our so body good. will reveal to us uh, those things that we're going through, and sometimes it's God. And so I love that thought, um, that sometimes it makes your stomach hurt. So uh, maybe that's it's not just what you- It's a good one, and maybe, that fear doesn't mean it's not from God, 100%, right? It's like we 100%. need to push through that with courage and with strength and yes. just kind of confidence in knowing that God is with us. Yes, amen, yeah. amen. Well, hey, turn to somebody that you're watching it with, hopefully, and let them know kind of what you're going through and what you're thinking about afterwards. Um, well, all right, well, we've been talking about this for a few weeks, and I don't know about you, but we are ready for it. This Tuesday, December 14th, we'll gather in the Worship Center for our Lights of Hope service at 6.30 p.m. to reflect, to pray, and to share the hope that we desperately need, and we hope you'll join us. For those of you that attend in person, we want you to know this Thursday, December 16th, will be our last typical Thursday night service of the year. We will have Christmas Eve services the following Thursday on December 23rd, but our regular Thursday night service is taking a brief break and we will be back on January 13th. Like Angela said, our candlelight Christmas Eve services aren't this Thursday, but the following Thursday and Friday, and they are filling up. So don't wait to save your spot for in-person services because reservations are required this year. Join us on December 23rd for four, and we just added a new service time, 5.30. And then on December 24th at 1, 2.34 and 5.30 p.m. Online services will be on December 24th at those same times, so 1, 2, 34, and 5, 30 p.m. So if you worship with us online, we will see you at one of those services. And if you have family and friends and you'd like to join us, it's not too late to invite them to worship with us on Christmas Eve online at prof.church. Speaking of online worship, on Sunday, December 26th, all of our services will be online only. There will be no in-person services that day, so plan to join us back here online at Prov.Church at our normal worship times of 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. Central. And looking ahead to the new year, the next semester of the Providence Bible Academy begins January 10th. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible Academy, it's six classes offered in a rotational basis with each studying a different section of the Bible. You can jump in at the beginning of any semester, and this time, Bible professor Larry Hellyer will lead us through the book of Acts. You can get more information on one of these and sign up at prob.church slash program. Well, don't forget, if you're a guest with us today, we would love to meet you in a video Zoom call, and we're throwing that link out for you right now. But before we leave this space, let us send you out with this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.